Greetings, and welcome to the Open-Minded Skeptic Podcast. My name is Sharon Ann Rowland, and I'm your host. And today, we will be covering another Trump phenomena discussion on, this time, the Kavanaugh confirmation and the hashtag MeToo movement. President Donald Trump nominated Judge Brett Kavanaugh to become an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States on July 9, 2018, filling the vacancy left by the retirement of Anthony Kennedy. When nominated, Kavanaugh was a sitting judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. The Senate Judiciary Committee began Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing on September the 4th this year. At the end of the confirmation process, Kavanaugh was accused of sexually assaulting Christine Blasey Ford 36 years prior, while they were both in high school in 1982. The Senate Judiciary Committee postponed its scheduled vote to allow both Blasey Ford and Kavanaugh to respond. In the interim, two other women, Deborah Ramirez and a Julie Swet- Swetnick, alleged separate instances of sexual assault. Kavanaugh categorically denied allegations made by Ford, Ramirez and Swetnick. Both Kavanaugh and Blasey Ford were questioned by members of the Judiciary Committee and Arizona-based sex crimes prosecutor Rachel, Rachel Mitchell on September the 27th. The following day, the Judiciary Committee voted 11 to 10, very, very slim, to send the nomination to the floor. Senator Jeff Flake, a Republican in Arizona, and later the full Senate Judiciary Committee, requested a week-long FBI supplemental background investigation into the sexual assault allegations. On October the 6th, the Senate voted 50 to 48 to confirm Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court post the FBI findings. And it was an interesting finding because they didn't allow the report to go outside of a seal, what they call a skiff which is a, a sealed room, so no one can, and no one was allowed in with any devices. So whatever they read in that FBI report um, voted him in, which is interesting, but we'll never get to see that, obviously. Considering that conservative Brett Kavanaugh was replacing Anthony Kennedy, another conservative-leaning judge, do you think the request by the Democratic senators for President Trump to select a more left-leaning judge was inappropriate? Or should each new appointment to the Supreme Court be on a bipartisan basis? Um, I think ideally (coughs) appointments to the Supreme Court ought to be on a bipartisan basis, but that's not in reality the way it goes. And... uh, Therefore, I think replacing Anthony Kennedy with another conservative uh, leaning ju- judge is justified. But the whole idea of a Supreme Court justice is that he should be able to weigh the information, you know, based on the based on the information that's presented, and weigh it and come up with an answer. And uh, therefore, it shouldn't really matter whether he's Republican or Democrat. And I think Brett Kavanaugh can can remain objective. Yes, no, I I agree. Um, Sheila, what do you think? Do you think the new appointment to the Supreme Court should be selected on a bipartisan basis? Look, I'm with you and Bobby. Um, I didn't see a lot of it in the early part of um, the whole process and then something you mentioned a couple of months ago and it was like, oh, I must read up a bit more on that. And it, it's like, let's give a lynch party almost, isn't it? Oh, God, yeah. It was, yeah, I, I am I, I am pro-Trump, as we all know. Um, but I, even I was shocked at the level of vitriol um, thrown at this man. Yeah. So, um and so, 
I mean, it, it isn't supposed to be bipartisan, the whole process. You're right, Bobby. It really isn't. It's supposed to be the best. Basically, the Supreme Court is the epitome of where, if you're a judge, that's that's like nirvana. That's where you want to get to. So it should be based on the last 30 years of your judgments and how you, if you if you adhered to the law and if you um, were a good judge, that's what it should be based on, not on what party you, you align with. Um, but what's happened is, I believe it, it stopped being that when um, just after Bush and they started to vote in judges based on their political leanings, um, which is really sad. Um, and now it has become a, you know, it has become a party, you know, thing. And at the moment, I believe there's more conservatives on there than liberal. Is that correct, Bobby? Or is it? E you, I, think I think. Yeah, I think it's slightly more conservative. But the other thing to keep in mind is these people are appointed for life, and Kavanaugh's a young man, relatively speaking. Yeah, so he's going to be there for for quite some time. I'm. I have a feeling that um, that woman who's like just had the accident. What's her name? Uh, the. Oh, her yeah, name. I know who you mean. I, I think she's going to be stepping down. She's eighty. Um, and she just had the. Uh, she just had a, another accident, a falling over accident. Yeah, so, plus she's pretty useless. I mean, she falls asleep at times and all this <laughs> kind of stuff. <laughs> I didn't know that. But um, I saw her on a show and she looked decrepit. I've got to say it. She was kind of a, there was something wrong with her arms. They were kind of into her body and she was kind of leaning. I mean, her, I'm sure her brain's still there um, because she was speaking quite eloquently. But her body was just, oh, my God, it was. I, I kind of looked at her and thought, let her retire, you know, <laughs> let her have some time to, you know, have some. I was actually a bit shocked. I, and she, but she is very left leaning. She's I'd actually call her a leftist. And some of the judgments she's made we, would make you blush. Seriously. Um, yeah, well, I'm sure the, the Democratic Party is putting process, putting pressure on her to hang out for, you know, another couple of years so that. There'll be a Democrat in the presidency, you know. Just, just hang on, you know. Don't, don't die yet, or don't resign. But I think she's going to step down. I think she has to. Oh, well, so do I. I mean, from what I saw, like I've seen her in two different events now, and both times, you know, she, she looks like she needs a rest. <laughs> she needs let her, let her just have the last few years, you know, enjoyably with her family and friends, you know. Um, but anyway, so I, I agree with you. I reckon she'll go, and I think there's a potential other one. So in the next two to three years, so there will be a very. I think by the time Trump leaves the presidency, because I I believe he'll get voted back in in 2020. I believe by the time he leaves, there'll only be a couple of liberals left on that Supreme Court, which I think will be a good thing down the track. But then I'm very conservative. <laughs> if you're more, if you're more. Um, you know, lefty related, you probably, that's like a horror story for most people. So, um, Amanda, so considering that conservative Brett Kavanaugh was replacing Anthony Kennedy, another conservative leaning judge, do you think the request by the Democratic senators for President Trump to select a more left leaning judge was inappropriate? Or should each new appointment to the Supreme Court be on a bipartisan basis? What, do you, what are your feelings? Uh, well, especially where, like, yeah, as Bobby said, these guys are going in for life. Like, you know, I mean, you don't you don't get to Supreme Judge and sort of go, oh, I'm just going to be here for like five years and uh, that's all I'm planning on doing, um, like a lot of our, our politicians. Um, you know, they, they go in there and they expect to be in that position for as long as they can. And, I mean, lovely that's falling over and, and being a little bit decrepit. I mean, she's showing it. She is trying to be there as long as she can and, and you know, um, all that sort of thing. So really it's, um, I mean, when you look at it, really they should be, if, if you want a Supreme judge that can do the job and, and can be, I guess, uh, you know, do the job properly, they have to be actually unaligned. They have to be, you know, they have to be someone that, that, that can see both sides of the story and play, and take the take the information and and use it and and play the role of being the mediator the the um non-aligned mediator so 
I mean, for, um, you know, like, real, you, you know. I know what you're saying. It's the to select, to select, yeah, to select a left, to select a lefty, like, you know, a lefty or a righty, really, when you think about it. If you're selecting a lefty or a righty, at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're putting someone in there that has a particular thought pattern or wavelength. And that means that everything that they they judge on, a- any decisions they make, is going to be is going to be backed by that left or right hand thought pattern. That's that's what it comes down to. You really need, like, really a supreme supreme court judge should be someone that can sit squarely in the middle and go, I can see both sides of the story, but I can also see what what is sitting in front of me, the evidence or the information sitting in front of me. And from the outside point of view of looking in, this is what I believe to be the right choice or, or the, the ultimate outcome. Um, you know, so it, you know, should it, I don't even think it should be bipartisan. I, should, I think it should be completely and utterly non-aligned because otherwise you, you really are, even, even bipartisan, you know, if they've got the support of both parties, that's great. But that means that they can be swayed either way. Whereas, you know, and that, and I mean, look, to say that money doesn't get handed around is a load of crap. Um, you know, it's, um, so at the end of the day, I, I think, you know, if you can find someone that, and I mean, it's really hard and I, I don't profess it to be an easy thing, but someone that can actually say, well, actually, I don't align with anybody. I'm actually, I'm actually happy to see what the information is and make my decision on that. That is essentially who you want to be Supreme Court judge. Um, but also, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, look, you, you want someone that has got the um, the experience and the understanding of what the role is going to entake too because, you know, I mean, just, to, you know, if you've only been a certain style judge for so long, well, then that's all you really know. You don't. If, if you if you haven't got the experience or the broad broad experience that a Supreme Court judge will require, well then really it makes it very very hard to be um, uh, you know to, to be to be non non biased or, or you know uh, unaligned so or, or have a particular way of thinking. I, I think I think the problem's been that um, a couple of the liberal ones that have got on to the Supreme Court, have been voting outside the constitution on certain things or not. They basically been interpreting the constitution rather than um, about, you know, following the lines of it. And um, hmm. yeah, they've been interpreting it is, is how people kind yeah. of have been referring to it. During the confirmation process, Sheila, Kavanaugh was accused of sexually assaulting Christian, sorry, Christine Lazy Ford, currently a professor in clinical psychology at Paolo, Paolo Alta University, while they were both in high school. On September the 17th, three days prior to the final vote, so he'd already been 13 days into like really acrimonious testimony. So he'd, he'd already endured 13 days at this point. So the hearing occurred September the 27th. Um, the committee announced that the confirmation would not proceed until both Ford and Kavanaugh responded in a hearing. The hearing occurred September 27, which was seven days post when the vote should have been taken. Both parties were questioned by members of the Judiciary Committee, as well as an Arizona-based sex crimes prosecutor called Rachel Mitchell. Kavanaugh categorically denied the allegation. So we're dealing just with the first allegation here, Christine Blasey Ford. So A, so Sheila, Christine Blasey Ford came up short on evidence repeatedly, and it seemed that the only details she could remember were those that were most damaging to Kavanaugh, that he was drunk, that he held her down on the bed, etc. She did not remember how she got to the party and how she got home from the party, where the party was or when it was held. Considering that every witness she named, and she named about four, has denied being at the party, including her best friend, do any of, do you believe her story? Well, the the first thing that comes to my mind, um, Sharon, would be selective memory. Um, 
if, if why wait so long if that was the situation? Why wait 36 years or whatever? Um, if it was such a, a traumatic event, why not go to someone when it happened? Um, and why wait until someone is in that Supreme Court nomination and, you know, as you said, 13 days or whatever into your testimony to suddenly um, want to present this? It, it seems very staged to me. I agree. Um, what do you think, Amanda? Do you... Um Considering that every witness you named denied being at the party, including a best friend, for God's sakes, um, do you believe her story? See, this is a hard one because, one, it's it's 30-something years down the track. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, your, your memory, and this is scientifically, your memory is, um, you know, even your memory isn't considered... Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, infallible anymore because they've proven that our, our mind and, and our brain uh, will actually create a collage um, of, of memory. So, you know, even though we sit there and go, I can remember it like it was yesterday, well, actually you don't. It's a, it's a, you, your brain will actually fill in the gaps and, and create a collage uh, around specific emotions and thoughts and stuff like that. Did something happen 36 years ago for her? Maybe. Was it Kavanaugh? That is really hard to prove now. I mean, you know, unless it's a Monica Lewinsky style thing where she's got a dress that has, you know, beautiful evidence on it. You know, the, it, it's it's um it's you know it really to a certain to to an extent it is hearsay. It is. It is a collaborations of emotions that she felt 36 years ago that have imprinted her brain. Um, you know, a, again, I mean, there's a, there's a part of me that goes, okay, she waited so long into his actual thing. Was she not expecting him to get it? Or, you know, uh, or was it that, um, again, was it, you know, brought up? Uh, you know, again, was it staged um, from someone that had had... Yeah, I should just yeah, I mean, out. She she didn't wait that long. She actually submitted a letter prior. Di uh, yeah. Senator Diane Feinstein sat on the letter. Ah. So, yeah. So I just wanted to clarify that she had actually submitted the letter. She wanted to yeah. remain anonymous, and then she was pretty much outed by. She, she, there was an article in the Washington Post, and then Diane Feinstein. Sat on the letter that she had, so she said, so, "Yeah." Well, then, then, but then that changes it, doesn't it? Like, I mean, if she's if she submitted the letter and the letter was sat on, well, then that's, I mean, it, it sort of puts a little bit of something to it. But yeah, again, I mean, I mean, he's been a he's been a, a, a you know a district court judge, wasn't it? Uh, for how 20 plus long? Yeah. Twenty plus. Yeah, years. and I mean, and and he and and what good had he done in that time? Um, uh, and, and so is it that she was trying to show, I mean, cause yes, I mean, as we, as we spoke about Supreme court judge is in a position where they are in there for a long, well, he will be in there for a long time being a young man. Um, unless for some reason he is, you know, booted out or kicked out or whatever. Um, but you know, he, he could be potentially in there for a long time. Um, you know, uh, do I believe her story? Do I think something happened to her 36 years ago? Yes, I do, because it's imprinted in her brain somewhere. Does she, you know, is it uh, Mr. Kavanaugh or someone of a similar similar person? Maybe. Um, uh, is it... I won't, make you, know, you, I won't make you actually say yay or nay. Let, let's see what Bobby <laughs> says. Bobby, do you believe her story? Uh, no, I don't believe her story. And uh, even though uh, it was sat on, it was only like a month and a half or something. It wasn't like a real long time. And, you know, they may have been sitting on it to see what was going to happen. But no, I definitely don't believe her story. And the other thing is the just, justice that we couldn't think of is uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's, ah, that's the one. Good. Yeah. 
The one they made the stupid movie about. Have you seen it? Oh, my God, it's a joke. <laughs> no, no, I what, haven't seen it. I'm never getting that hour and a half back, I'll tell you. That's an hour and a half. I, I should don't, – don't do it to yourself. It was – oh, it was so – I can't, there's not even words to describe it, Bobby, but if you get the option, don't do it. (laughs) It sounds boring to start with, I mean, you know. Oh, yeah, it's, they tried to make her out to be this amazing, you know, you know, there are so many women that they could have made an, an, you know, bio about, and they chose her for a reason, and it's a political reason, but there are so many other women that are probably more worthy, you know. That's, that's what annoys me, anyway. Christine Blasey Ford has also refused to hand over her therapy notes as evidence. Most people believe this is because the therapy notes do not mention Justice Kavanaugh and also contradict how many people were present inside the room where the attack occurred. Apparently, she was attacked by four men do you think that the notes should have been handed over to all parties concerned? That's a bit of a tough one, Sharon, when you think <clears throat> client confidentiality, uh, and Amanda and I, you know, work mm. with, with people um, from a client basis. So... Just so that you know, you, the only reason we know about these notes is because she, she did show them to the Washington Post reporter and he wrote about the notes in the article. So she, she's already so, shown them to the reporter. Yeah. If you've already shown them to a reporter, um, then why wouldn't you hand them to a, an investigating party if that's what you were asked to do? It, it doesn't fit, does it? No, it's kind of like she thought it might muddy the waters. That's what I thought. And it will because, one, she didn't mention his name. And, two, she, 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 this is, I think it was a couple of years prior or five years prior that she had the therapy stuff done and the story had changed. So I think that's why she just thought it would be, you know. What, um, what do you think, Bobby? Do you think um, she should have hand, been forced to hand over the notes? Um, I originally was thinking no, because, you know, if the notes are related to her therapy, that should be protected. But uh, listening to what, what you said about giving them to the uh, to the journalist, then I'm thinking, yeah, if, if it was released to them, that's public and uh, they should be turned over then in their entirety. Amanda, what are your thoughts? Well, if, if she's got notes about the particular incident, yes. Anything else regarding anything else she's spoken about, censor it. Like if, if she doesn't want to talk about, you know, um, you know, like, you know, if, if she's talking about a range of things like, you know, say, say for instance, there might have been other, other forms of, of violence or, or assault or whatever in her in her world and she's spoken about them but she doesn't want them out, well, then censor them and just disclose the part that relates to, you know, um, that, that she's obviously shared. Um, but that has to be on her own merit too. Um, if the um, reporter has purely cited it and taken notes and then created these things, so that's all she's done as proof that that had happened or that she's experienced this then yeah i mean it's it's such a hard thing because she really should be like if she's prepared to show them to a reporter well, like yeah why not the investigating officer but yeah it kind of seems like it kind of seems weird that you wouldn't show them if you've shown them to a reporter yeah. if that makes sense yeah yeah, yeah. Bobby, Senator Dianne Feinstein, as we discussed earlier, who's a Democrat from California, sat on Christine Blasey Ford's letter of her account from July the 30th through to September the 17th, the entire time Justice Kavanaugh was being dissected by her Democrat colleagues unmercifully. Um, Should uh, Senator Feinstein have made the letter public the moment it was received and if, as she didn't, what do you think were her true motivations there? Yes, um, I think she should have, you know, made it, you know, 
given it to the rest of them, you know, when she received it. And uh, the only reason I can think of why she didn't was that she was holding it to see if, if it would be needed. You know, if it looked like things, you know, were going okay without it, I think she would have just not given it. But to do that, that would mean that she didn't believe it was real. Because it was like, you only use it if if we're at that point. It's like... It's yeah, like, yeah, but I mean, whenever you... it Maybe she believed it was real, who knows, but whenever you... Whenever you toss that into the mix, is anybody else going to believe it's real? You know, and maybe she figured, why take the chance? I'll see if I need it. Um, Amanda, what do you think were her true motivations in holding on to that letter? Um, well, one, I think she should have made the letter. Um, you know, I think I think she should have I think she should have made the letter letter public the moment it came out. I mean, this like again, this isn't a uh, you know a, 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 a small position they're filling. It's not like a little PA or something like that. This is Supreme Court judge. Um, what were her things? I mean, look, maybe maybe there. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, she you know, Miss Miss Senator Diane, uh, you know, maybe she was looking to use it as a bit of a uh, a leverage later on, you know what I mean? Like, because at the end of the day, I mean, she was a Democrat uh, or she's a Democrat-aligned, uh, you know, um, senator. So, you know, uh, was she was she hoping was she hoping to use it for her own benefit? You know what I mean? Like, well, you know, Mr. Supreme Court Judge, Mr. Kavanaugh, I have some damning evidence against you, and uh, you know, I could easily use this. Or was she, you know, um, you know, in, in order to get something that I need for, uh, you know, good old California? Like, was she looking to use it as a bit of a, a, uh, you know, greasing of the, the, um, you know, the, the, you know, the pot so that she could get what she wanted? Um, you know what I mean? Like, at yeah, the end of the day, I mean, it's, it, it's, you know, at the end of the day, why would you, why would you hold on to a piece of information like that when? You know, you know that there is, you know, that this is such a big, big position to be filling. Like, I mean, it's. I think, yeah. I, personally, I think she held, she held on to it that long because the whole purpose of this um, attack on Kavanaugh was to delay him getting on the Supreme Court before the midterms, and because mm. she was expecting them to have this blue wave, which didn't, which turned out to be a bit of a puddle, more of a blue puddle than a wave. And um, they got the House, but they didn't get the Senate. And um, mm -hmm. and I think she was hoping that they'd have this blue wave. And after the midterms, if they delayed Kavanaugh, they could just all say no, basically. They just have a vote and vote no. Um, so that's what I think the actual motivation was. What do you think, Sheila? Yeah, I, I'm pretty much with you. That the word in the back of my mind though would be blackmail, as Amanda was saying. Is it? Yeah, you, you know, took, you've gone right to the blackmail. <laughs> <laughs> Christine Blasey Ford also could not remember if she took a polygraph test on the same day as her grandmother's funeral. Again, this ha this funeral occurred less than a month prior. Out of ten, is she telling porky pies? What do you think? Ooh, uh, look, that's. I mean, okay, grandmother's funeral depends on how close she is. You could forget her doing something, but that, again, a polygraph is not something that you do every day. So I, I kind of. I kind of feel like she's telling a bit of a porky if she did or didn't, because regardless of what it is, if she if she's saying she can't remember, that's uh, you know a, a polygraph isn't something you go to, yeah, and just yeah, it's it's not a simple process. So I, I couldn't imagine you forgetting going on that, going and doing it. I agree. Yeah. What do you, Bobby? I've uh, <clears throat> never heard of porky pies, but I get the gist, <laughs> and. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, that she should definitely remember it. I mean, maybe you could argue that, you know, the trauma of her grandmother's death, you know, affected her. But still, I, I, I think she would remember it. 
and uh, yeah. So Sheila, out of what, from one through to ten, what's her porky pie rating? Oh, I reckon she's probably a ten plus, personally. Yeah, oh, I didn't think, but I, I think he's a definite ten, that's for sure. Um, so Amanda, do you want to give us a porky pie rating, one to ten? Yeah, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna say probably a ten. Like that's yeah, like I said, you can't forget a polygraph test, you know. No. So maybe the day she could forget the day, but not necessarily actually doing it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. And I, I it's funny after writing out our our notes for tonight, I did a bit more research, and do you know what? They only asked her two questions. Really? The joking. No, and do you know what? To, isn't like, I don't know if what I see in a movie when they do a polygraph is the same as in reality, but usually the first two questions are, what's your name? It's it's like a baseline to work out if they're lying or not. They ask yes. them to say something truthfully and something. So if they only ask the two questions, did she actually have a polygraph? Well, I'm assuming that the ones that were used to calibrate it are not counted there. Oh, okay. Mm. I'm hoping you're right, Bobby, because otherwise, I don't think that she, I mean, even even in that situation, if the baseline was in place and then she was asked, the two, I still think that's a very, that's not a, a long time, <laughs> a large amount of questions to ask somebody. Surely there's a lot mm. of questions you could be asked. Do you know what the two questions are? No, no, they didn't. It was privileged or whatever. Um, but I, I just thought that was interesting mm. too. That I just found that out, and I'm just a bit gobsmacked because I just did you all just expect it to? She at least have like eight or nine questions thrown at her, rather than yeah. two. Things a little pathetic. Mm. Anyway. But then what two does is it says to people that they can now say, "Oh, well, she passed the polygraph," but yeah. you don't see anyone that she's only she only got asked two questions. So to me, that's kind of fraudulent because I'd expect that I wouldn't give that much weight. Is are you on? Am I thinking differently here to, to everybody else? I I wouldn't no. think that a good polygraph if she only had two questions. Yeah, and I seem to remember. I could be wrong. Something about maybe she was like she was teaching people how to pass a polygraph exam. Yeah, that came out later. She she actually had a, a good friend who was applying for a role in the FBI, I think, Bobby, or the DOD. And she she her friend asked her to give her some coaching on how to pass polygraphs. And she actually said, she answered a question in the hearing saying that she had never done anything like that previously. So she actually lied to the committee. Wow. And that didn't come out till later as well. Amanda, the final nail in her coffin for me was the fact that she used an additional door being added to her home as support for her trauma from the Kavanaugh attack when documents revealed that it had been put in to allow her to rent a spare room to a student years earlier. So basically what she said is she, because of the trauma that she'd experienced from Kavanaugh, she'd insisted that they renovate their house to have two exits so she could get away from somebody you know, attacking her. But what actually happened was um, they went to the building authority and discovered that it actually went in like five or six years prior to her accusation. So it wasn't a recent addition. And at the time on the submission to the building authority, it was to allow them to rent it out to students. So again, another porky pie. So, so just in general, guys, is anyone here still on board the Ford train? No. So I, I, never, I never was. <laughs> was I from the moment she opened her mouth? Okay, Amanda, how's your how's your bleeding heart still bleeding? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, look, it's one of those. Like I said, her, her story's filled with holes, and it has been from the beginning. Like I said, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I don't dismiss that she may have had something happen thirty six years ago. Um, but the thing is, I think it's just there's so much circumstantial 
evidence and and you know and porky pie telling uh that you know there's just you know like it's just too too full of holes to be able to really sort of cement it like and that's what makes it really hard is is you know it's if she's a, if she's a victim yeah okay cool you know you want to you want to support them and, and help them thing but there just seems to be so many so many so many holes in these in the in the in the descriptions and all that sort of stuff so i it makes it it makes it very hard to sort of go okay yeah no look you something happened to you but uh, you know when this happens you're sort of like okay but you're not really giving us either the full story or the whole story or any of the story for that matter, you know? So am I, on, I mean, I, I was never really, never really on it because it just seemed really, um, you know, yeah. 36 years later. I mean, that's, that's huge. I mean, he'd already been a judge for how long? Why, why was there no, none of it being brought forward even before that, even before he went up for the nomination? I mean, yeah. On September the 23rd, a second woman, Deborah Ramirez, accused Kavanaugh of sexual assault in 1983, when apparently he exposed himself and thrust his genitalia into her face during a party in a dorm room at Yale University when they, where they, when they were both students in the early 80s. Again, Kavanaugh categorically denied the allegation. So we'll start with Bobby. This allegation came out of nowhere six days after the Ford allegations. What do you all, what do you think about the timing? Yeah, I think the timing is just too uh, coincidental and it makes it unbelievable to me. Yeah. Sheila, would you classify a drunk man waving his junk in your face at a frat party as an attack? I, I thought about this when I read it, and I actually laughed. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think if you were um, the sort of person who was going to go to a drunken frat party, that you'd probably have some level of expectation that something might happen like that. Well, if anyone's watched Animal House, definitely. I mean... Mm -hmm or na Bad Neighbours or any of those movies. Um, I mean, I, we're Australian, so we don't, we don't, that's the only kind of place I can go to for a reference. Um, Bobby, maybe we should ask Bobby. Bobby, would you classify a drunk man waving his junk in your face at a frat party as an attack? Pretend um, to be. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I would think it's more exposure rather than an attack. Yeah, it's like a flasher, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, Unless he was, like, hitting her in the face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's not get into that. We, we have a special place in Australian history about that, don't we, don't we ladies? Oh, <laughs> we'll tell you about it one day, Bobby. It's, we don't want to bring it up that often, though. It's embarrassing to Australia. The FBI were forced by Senator Flake to perform a more thorough investigation and the president gave them a week. Following this investigation, the FBI interviewed Ramirez and two of her alleged eyewitnesses to the, jail, the Yale University incident. Agents also interviewed a close friend of Ramirez from college. The result was no corroboration of the allegations at all. The New York Times interviewed several dozen of her classmates in an attempt to corroborate her story and could find no one with first-hand knowledge. This has led to Ramirez being referred to the Senate leader by the Senate leader to authorities to be charged. Do you think, Amanda, she should be charged for fraud like a number of other false accusers have been? So there's been like three of them now that have falsely accused him and they've just been referred to the FBI or to law, law enforcement. Do you think, though, that Ramirez should have been? Well, yeah, because, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, again, if they're falsely accusing um, due to being paid money or whatever or, or, or whatever it is that, you know, whatever or, or whatever they, they're expecting to get out of this, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, uh, 
you know, is it just uh, jumping on the bandwagon and hoping for a payout um, or is it, you know, um, actually there was something serious going on? Um, it seems a little bit weird that, yeah, it's six days after Ford comes out, which is, but then again, if they're trying to build a case, what you want is more people to come forward. So, you know, I don't know. It's yes, I do because if it's if there's no collaborative evidence that that proves that that happened, uh, then yeah, again, you know, look, that's that's a you know, you're you're you know, it's defamation of character. You know, it's it's you know, it's um you know, so and and a and a character of high standing. So you sort of. I mean, again, you, you don't want to, um, you know, he's not untouchable, but the thing is you, you don't want to defame his character if it's not true, you know what I mean? If it's if it's not, well, if there's no evidence to back it up. like there was, There's been absolutely zero evidence and he's not been given the usual innocent before proven guilty. Basically, he was put, he was in, a, in the position of... Um, been guilty mm. and then had had every had, and then was it basically was attacked for like 14 days prior then attacked by three people then in, after he's already been the fbi had already investigated him six times prior he then went through uh two fbi additional investigations and they they found nothing mm. it's just yeah so he, I feel really bad for the dude, to be honest. During the Kavanaugh hearings, the Me Too movement went into overdrive and the hashtag Believe Women was born. How much damage and or support do you think this Believe Every Woman mantra provided Justice Kavanaugh? Um, I don't think it would affect them too much because it's like a separate issue and, uh, you know, seems a little ridiculous to me. But, you know, so I think I think it's a separate issue which shouldn't have affected them. I actually think it helped him because it made a lot of people see the situation as ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. And I also think that when Ramirez made her allegations, that completely blew lazy thought out of the water. I think at that point, everyone still kind of had, you know, a bleeding heart for her. And um, because they also felt that she'd been set up by Diane Feinstein. So, but then I think when Ramirez came out, that was the end of it. So Sheila and Amanda, which is one of you wish to answer this, um, as, as we just read, during the Kavanaugh hearings, the Me Too movement went into overdrive and this hashtag Believe Women was born. How much damage from the female perspective or support do you think this Believe Every Woman mantra provided him? Which one of you want it? Um, I don't think it actually... I don't think it actually damaged him. That's, that's the thing. I don't think it actually damaged him it's damage just I, I i the thing is i think what it's done is is um really i look at the end of the day it hasn't damaged him it, he, he's still been put in the position hasn't he like he's the last i read he'd he'd, he'd gotten through so it hasn't actually really damaged him uh, as such um, I think the lack of evidence helped him, um, and and that was the thing. He had he had three women come up and and make accusations, but there was not enough evidence, and not even enough, and 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 you couldn't even say it was really circumstantial evidence that no could put him there. That's what I mean. Like that's it. It was all it was, it, yeah. So you know, did it hurt him? No. If anything, I think it actually helped him because. He was able to actually, with, without like he was able to have the FBI turn around and say, "No, nah, he didn't do it." What yeah, more I backing do you want? I mean, yeah. If anything, it's just it's made a, a lot of women 
super angry in the world again. Like it's it's just yeah, you know I mean it's it's pushed it's pushed a real um it, you know, at the end of the day it's not hurting Kavanaugh. It's gonna hurt all the good men in the world. You know what I mean? It's gonna hurt all the the men that are, you know, good good blokes. You know, that's because it's it's um you know, you're gonna get those ladies that are just gonna you know they're, they're already looking for a fight. Did it was Kavanaugh hopefully the meal ticket? Yeah. But I don't think it actually hurt him. You know you know what's really sad? Now that the Democrats have won the House, one of their promises, they made a couple of promises. One was to impeach the president, and the second promise they made was to drag Kavanaugh back into the court system. Oh, wow. Even after it's been proved that, you know, these women were just... Anyway. On September the 28th, the Senate Judiciary Committee voted 11 to 10 to send the nomination to the floor, where senators would decide whether or not to proceed with the confirmation in the following week. On the same day, after a request from Senator Jeff Flake, who's actually, who was a Republican in Arizona, he's about to, he got voted out because of this thing, followed by a request from the Senate Judiciary Committee, President Trump ordered a week-long FBI supplementary background investigation into sexual assault allegations against Kavanaugh. Should Senator Flake not have been such a snowflake? He, he actually got ambushed in a lift by two women screaming at him, basically. And it, when he went into the lift, he was pro-Kavanaugh. When he came out, I think they um, damaged him. And he, he then appealed and said, we need an extra week. Um, so what do you think? Do you think he should have um, stood his ground? Uh, that, that's an interesting one because um, why is it just, from my perspective, why is it just one senator saying uh, we need this? Wouldn't you think if, if you've got 21 senators or people from the Judiciary Committee could be more than one say, wow, this doesn't seem right, we need more information? Mm. Well, all the Democrats were saying it as well, but he was the only Republican that actually said it. Okay. He, um, mm. Basically, he got beat. He, he was, he was um, I think he was trying to appeal to the base in his state and um, they voted him out anyway because they were disgusted with him, I think, because he was he, he turned on um, Kavanaugh. And I think that's what really yeah. put him. Um, Finished him off, yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. So um, what do you think, Bobby? You're over there. Do you think um, uh, Senator Blake was a snowflake? <clears throat> See, I was a little confused about this one, but basically what I've got out of it is that... Um, I think that, uh, see, he's a Republican, and yeah. and it says on the same day after the request from Flake, um, it was followed by a request from the Senate Judiciary Committee, which I guess he was the head or a member of, and then President Trump ordered a week-long supplemental background investigation. So I'm thinking that this is almost like the icing on the cake. It's like after we've you know, totally proven Kavanaugh clean. Let's throw on another week of a of a FBI investigation. You think it might have been a planned thing? I'm thinking it it couldn't hurt it couldn't hurt Kavanaugh or Trump. I mean, it was it was already at the point where they were sure that there was no problem with him, and since since the Senate Judiciary Committee wanted it. Why not give it to him and let him do another week and, you know, can't hurt? I suppose um, at this point we're at, you're at September the 28th, which meant the initial vote was supposed to, let me look back, was supposed to have occurred on September the 20th. So, so at that point it had already been delayed eight days. 
So, um, and now they were asking for another seven days. And the midterms were still, well, the midterms are still a good four weeks away. So, and I suppose from uh, the Republicans' perspective, they were probably looking at it as, okay, this is just another delay and we don't want any more delays. But you're, um, in hindsight, yeah, I can see why you'd look at it that way because it is, it was icing on the cake, you're right. September the 26th, Michael Avenatti released a sworn declaration by a third woman, a Julie Swetnick, who alleged another incident had occurred. Um, so we'll start with Sheila. Julie Swetnick alleged Kavanaugh would cause girls to become inebriated and disoriented so they could then be gang raped in a side room or bedroom by a train of numerous boys during the early 1980s, while students were in high school or college. She also said that on one occasion she was raped, but kept attending the parties after. Do you think that this is normal behaviour, post-abuse, to attend more parties and not to raise the alarm? No, I, I personally do not. And she's not actually saying that he um, had any form of um, sexual conduct with her is she she's saying he would cause girls to become inebriated and disoriented well surely the girls had a choice whether they drank or not but if i mean if you if you had been gang raped at a party would you be going back to a party no of course not and she apparently she returned to these parties for over a year so multiple parties yeah um, yeah. Man, what it's do you another think? one that raises a red flag, isn't it? Yeah. But, Amanda, what do you think? Would you have done that? No, because, I mean, at the end of the day, you look at someone that's been through that sort of trauma, the last thing you want to do is be put back in that situation. Mm. I mean, that's, I mean, that, I mean, even, like, I mean, you, you look at, you look at someone that is, you know, um, uh, kidnapped. I mean, you know, you look at someone that has the the um, uh, the thing where they've been kidnapped and they've been kept and they become attached to their their um, you know kidnapper. Um, that's that's different to this situation where she's supposedly being gang raped and then still continues to go to the same place where she has been. Um, assaulted most people when they have some form of assault like that they they don't go near the place of the issue they don't go near the um you know that they, they don't want to relive any of that situation um and you know places like going back to the same party would trigger memories and it doesn't matter if, if they were inebriated or not it would still be triggering that deep subconscious memory so yeah, I don't. That that just seems really odd. That yeah. you know. Um, no, I'm with you. I mean, I I can't. The thing that gets me is she knew it was happening. She didn't raise the alarm. Yeah. I mean, I would raise the alarm if I knew. I wouldn't let lead other girls to the slaughter. I mean, that's just not yeah. a normal human. Even in, even though it was the 1980s, where you know, uh, crazy stuff was still happening. You know, post 70s. But yeah, like I mean, that was the thing. It's you, you. There, there would still be, yeah, there would still be a reason to raise the alarm. Like it, you know, the the eighties were all about, you know, women starting to gain their 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 independence in the way of of being, you know, um, you know, like you know, to, to when they, you know, they started they started working, they started holding positions and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, like to if she was a, you know, if she was at college and, and you know, and, and someone that was, you know, wanting to become something, I mean, you sort of think, well, you know, stand up and be counted. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I find that, yeah, I find it a bit of a, a big sort of a red flag there. Mm. The report of the attack, um, when it was investigated, quoted a handful of unnamed witnesses who questioned Swetnick's credibility. 
two men who had previously had relationships with her, a Dennis Ketterer and a Richard Benicki, said she had never mentioned Kavanaugh or being the victim of sexual assault. How much credence would you give to the men, Bobby? Swetnick had been in a past relationship with both. Well, see, this one depends because in my mind, it depends on the kind of relationship she had with these men, how deep of a relationship. I would think that, you know, this might be something that she would only reveal to someone that she had a real deep relationship with. Mm. Yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing. I, I actually saw one of these guys interviewed and I thought I was thinking the same thing to myself. I mean, it looks like, like one of them, I think she had quite a, a few years of a relationship with, but the other one was a shorter period of time. And I was thinking, well, I'd probably give more credence to the guy who was in the relationship with for years than the, the six-week guy, don't you? Hmm. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I was going. But, I mean, even you could be in a relationship with someone for two years and still never get to a real deep level. But, and you know. You also don't know how the relationships ended. They may have been acrimonious, hey? So, and then this is the guy's getting back at her or something. So, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'd give much credence. Do you agree, Bobby? Or, or do you think, you know, just don't yeah, know? Yeah, I, 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 because I don't know any of these variables, yeah, I think I wouldn't give too much credence. So, Sheila, the FBI report concluded that there not only was not enough evidence to back Swetnick's claims, it also appeared that Julie Swetnick and Mr. Abernathy criminally, criminally conspired to make materially false statements to the committee and to obstruct the committee's investigation. Senator Grassley asked Attorney General Jeff Sessions and the FBI on October the 25th to investigate further. Do you agree, Sheila, this was the correct course of action, or do you think this would put new accusers off making accusations? Well, I think if they've, if it's seen and there's obviously some type of evidence to say that they've um, conspired to make false statements and materially false statements mean, you know, there may well be, as I said, a, a monetary payoff in there somewhere. Well, the, this guy isn't doing this for nothing, is he? Um, mm. Taking on someone's case... Yes, you can have the, you know, look, I'll look after you and I'll um, support you and so on. But the whole thing, as I said, just has that odd odour to it that says, no, there's something really dodgy here. And does it um, put new accusers off making accusations? If they're telling the truth, why would it? If they've got nothing to back up what they're saying and it's a false accusation, then let's hope it does put them off. Yeah. In hindsight, Bobby, why do you believe the Senate made the right or the wrong decision to send Justice Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court? I think they made the right decision to send him to the Supreme Court because the evidence was totally insufficient. And in some cases, it was just totally ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, I think they made the right call. I think he's going to do a good job. Yeah, I agree. Amanda, do you think they made the right or wrong decision, and why? I think they made the right decision with the information they had. Like, at the end of the day, they can they if they're to remain, uh, you know, um, unbiased, they've got to look at the information and go, right, is there enough evidence? No, there's not. Is he does all his previous judge, uh, you know, or, or career choices warrant him to be put forward? Yes. So, yes, we've had this come up. No, there's not enough evidence. He has been in, investigated how many times and found to be not guilty. This is his. This is his career as a judge, who he has obviously had a very good career to be put forward, uh, you know, and he's been a very good judge. So, yeah, I think they did the right thing. If if they have 
if it has been done all above board, you know what I mean? If if they've taken everything into account and and looked at it in a very unbiased way, yeah, they did make the right decision. Yeah. Anyway. Um, Sheila, um, in hindsight, why do you believe the Senate made the right or the wrong decision to send Justice Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court? Well, I, I, I'm with Bobby and Amanda. I, I believe it's the right decision. And allowing that the man's had some enormous spotlight shone on him and come out smelling, you know, pretty yeah. clean. Um, he's been character assassinated left, right and centre and nothing to support that. Um, I would hope that from the perspective of other people going to the Supreme Court, um, that they'd this man to start with. I'd, um, I found when, when they were talking about a couple of things with him, um, I felt that when they were talking about, you know, the things he, that have been written in his yearbook, I, I went through the 80s in school. I graduated in 85. So when they were talking about boothing and, and games and stuff, I recognised the, the wording that was actually written in his books and I agreed with him as to the definition of those things but I found um, a lot of the people were in the media were looking at the current times definition of things but I mean it's like the word gay you know 50 years ago gay did not mean homosexual man or a homosexual act being gay it nice. meant being happy and I in the 80s boothing did mean farting you know it did me and the game was a, a game that we even played over here in Australia um, and I just found it amazing that the media didn't know enough or hadn't done enough research to work that out that's when I kind of looked looked at the media and thought oh my god you would just you either do no research or you're just doing this on purpose I think that's one of the first yeah. times I actually looked at them and thought okay you really are biased and this is this is proof to me of it. So, um, so yeah. So, I think I think they made the right decision. Well, that's all for our podcast. Thanks for listening. And remember, if you want to support what we do, then share, subscribe, and leave a positive review over on iTunes for the open-minded skeptic. My team and I look forward to entertaining you once again in our next podcast. To check when our next podcast is, simply head over to www.tomspod.com. That's www.tomspod.com. <laughs>